is a big week for so many of us because it is back to school time. And uh, welcome back, college kids. Welcome back. Uh, um, I hear some tears. I hear some cheers from parents happen in there. Um, my little dude Hudson uh, began kindergarten this week. And so it's a big week. He's doing great. I'm doing fine. Um, <laughs> His, uh, his sister Grace there was so excited that she put on her own rainbow unicorn backpack just to be supportive of him. Um, it is a big deal, and back to school time is definitely worth celebrating. And so I know our Open Kids folks just, let, just headed out. Um, but if you're a student who started school this week, uh, can you just raise your hand for us? Um, awesome. Let's give them a round of applause. Woo! Awesome. We are so proud of you. We are, we are praying for you as you go back. And if you work in the school system or if you help out in school in any way, uh, just raise your hand for us now too. Awesome. Thank you for what you do. We are also praying for you. We are lifting you up. We are supporting you. Um, and thank you for being there. Uh, it's really, really cool because at the first week of of school, um, particularly if you work in school, you have a free pass to do whatever you want to on the weekend. And so the fact that you chose to spend it with us when you could have still been in your pajamas or chocolate or whatever, and everyone would have been just fine with that, is pretty amazing. And so thank you for coming and joining us. We just want you uh, to know we are lifting you up and praying for you, and we are so grateful for what you do. Uh, I love the beginning of these seasons, uh, and, and of course, college folks, your season is coming very soon, uh, but I love the beginning of it because it's like the beginning of a new story, right? The beginning of a, of a new chapter in the story, and who knows where it will lead uh, and how it will unfold, but you get to be a part of writing it in a new way this semester. To quote the great Dr. Seuss, of course, oh, the places you'll go, right? You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You're on your own. You know what to do, and you are the one who will decide where to go. Um, and the good doctor is mostly right in that, and that is so incredibly empowering. But that idea that we're the ones who will decide where we will go can also sound like a lot of pressure <laughs> in our lives too, right? Um, I have trouble deciding what to eat for dinner, uh, much less the trajectory of my life. And so, um, <laughs> as we go, but never fear. Um, the story that's laid out before us, the journey that we are on, is one that is walked one step at a time. And so if your step is waking up um, maybe in time to eat breakfast and making it to school, if that's the first step for you, then that is the beginning of the journey. And just know this, that every step of your way, you've got people with you. Uh, we're with you. Uh, your friends, your family group is with you. Most importantly, the God of love and of life, of justice and joy, of purpose and peace, who shaped you and formed you and knows you and loves you, is with you every step of your journey, every sentence of your story. And even more, that God invites your story to be a part this semester of the big story, of the story of God's work of love and liberation in our world, of, of creativity and courage and beloved community, of shalom, of this abiding, flourishing peace and life that comes from the heart of it all. God invites you to let the story of this season of your life, this semester of school, this season in the workplace, whatever it is for you, to be a part of the big story, to be a part of helping write the story of God's unfolding love and healing and restoration and shalom in our world. So in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your school, you write that big story whenever you choose, no matter how small it seems, whenever you choose love whenever you work for justice, whenever you welcome the outsider, you help another person flourish, whenever you yourself flourish holistically, whenever you live, as Jesus would say, in love of God and love of neighbor and love of yourself, you are helping write the big story in our world in a way that only you can, adding to the story what is yours to write. And the beauty of it all is that our own stories flourish and find meaning most when they're deeply connected to the big story of God's creative work of love and life and liberation in our world. When our own plots and our own character arcs are integrated in that big story, right in the thick of that story is where we most belong. And so if you want to know where the plot of it all is headed, 
Unfortunately, you can't just binge watch the show to see where it goes. Even though life may seem like Stranger Things right now, it doesn't quite work like that. You have to play it out. Um, But spoiler alert to it all, in this story, God's love wins, and God is with you, and God is good, and God loves you and all people and has an amazing part for you to play of bringing justice and joy and peace into this world, of bringing flourishing to all around you. And so I don't know the exact places you'll go, but I know a bit about where we're headed, that your story is, is built to be part of the big story of God's love at work in our world. And letting your story be a part of that is the greatest, most deeply fulfilling chapter that any of us could write. And so as we've gone through our series this summer, this summer we've been looking at some of the stories in our scripture library and sometimes looking at them in fresh ways. We've called it small story, big story, because as we've been re-listening to those stories, we've seen how some of these small stories point us and reflect the big story of God's love at work in the world for all people. But in the midst of of hearing these, there's been this other deeper layer that's been happening as well that we find as we listen to these stories that our story, uh, just like those that we encounter in our scripture library, that our story is built to be a part of that big story too. And when we find that, it's kind of (laughs) mind-blowing because for many of us, we don't feel like our story is much to offer. Or perhaps you feel unqualified to be a part of the big story. Maybe you felt that your story, your history, maybe you've been told that your story and your history somehow disqualifies you from the big story, but the big story blows that apart. It tells us that our God loves you with unqualified love. It says that you have a part to play, that who you are and where you're headed, where you have been, what you love, what stirs your heart, what stirs you with compassion, what fills you with passion, that these things are not unimportant idiosyncrasies, that they are essential, indispensable parts of the story that only you can help write. And so our scripture library is full of diverse people just like us who have found who they are and and where they are headed intersected by divinity and invited by an empowering God of love who saw them, knew their story, and invited them to write a creative chapter. We've learned about Esther and Moses and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've learned about John and Mary. We've learned about the Samaritan woman and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, some whose names we don't even know, but we know their story. The way that they've let their lives join the theme of the work of love in our world. And when they did, when they took who they were and offered it to the God who's at work in our world and offered it to their neighbor as themselves, a big story happened. And it was true for them, and it is true for you as well. And so this year, as you go into a new season of your life and you take your place in the cafeteria or in the break room, when life just happens to sit you down next to Addie or Anthony or Marcus or Mohammed, just know that this is a chapter in your story, and it's a chapter in their story as well. And together, this is a chapter in God's big story of love and life and liberation. And so around that cafeteria table, every time you choose to listen and learn and love and laugh together, what is being written is a big story bigger than you could imagine. And in its pages, you will find life that is abundant. And you might even find a friend as you write this story together, or at least score some extra fries in the cafeteria from those around you. A story that you're joining goes by many, many names. Uh, One name that appears often in our scripture library is the good news. Um, That is what Jesus' message and life was described as, good news of God. In Greek, that word good news is euangelion. Uh, which literally means good news or good message. And I love the simplicity of that title because that's what the heart of the whole Jesus story is about, that Jesus brought a good message from God uh, that was different than the religion and the empire of the day. And it was, for all who heard it and understood it, good news. And it was good news for all people. And another reason why I love the simplicity of that description is that for many of you, 
The messages that you've heard from religion and from the world have not always been good news. Right? And if that's you, I am so incredibly sorry. Because it is not the heart of God. The heart of God is love and welcome and openness. And if it is not good news, it is simply not God's news. If it's not good news for all people, then it is not God's message. The heart of this story is good news for all people. And when God says all people, God means all people. Because Jesus came to say to everyone, God loves you, God is with you. And the good life of justice and joy and peace is available to you. And in fact, the deepest, most divinest forces in the universe are at work, empowering you and seeking you that you might find it. And in Jesus, he unequivocally brought that message of good news to those who, who felt or had been told that they were far off. Jesus made it clear that the community of God was near to them. To those through whom the door had been closed, Jesus threw it open and said that the heart of God is open to all who seek. To those who thought the story wasn't for them, Jesus made them central characters in the big story. It was good news. And it still is for us today. It is good news for all people. And that's the story that we are invited to help write. And if you're like me, if you grew up around churchy kind of stuff, or if you just kind of like drank the water in the Bible Belt, you may have heard that phrase, good news, with a very specific and narrow context. In my upbringing, the whole of the good news uh, was built to fit on a bumper sticker or like a Christian t-shirt with a terrible pun. Um, there. But when we look at the multitude of the ways that that good news shows up in our scripture library, uh, rather than one narrow light that fits on a bumper sticker, we see thousands of lights that illuminate the breadth and the depth of God's good news, each from a different, diverse perspective, intersecting a different, diverse story, but all of them shining out. But, which is good news for those of us who can't quite fit our lives on a bumper sticker or in a hashtag or even like in a 10-second TikTok video. Um, that is because that is exactly what we find in Scripture, that no two people encounter Jesus in the same way. Because the good news is not a pithy Pinterest poster statement. It is a story. It is stories, real-life stories of you and me and our neighbors and all people intersecting with the light and the love of God that we see clearly in Christ. And the light that shines from Scripture is what happens when our stories, when those thousands of individual, contextual, diverse stories intersect with that big, epic story of the God who's drawn near to all of us in love. And every time, in every life, in every story, when we draw near to that love of God, the light that shines forth is good news of life and love. As the great Rachel Held Evans uh, wrote in her book, Inspired, the good news is good for the whole world, certainly. But what makes it good varies from person to person and community to community. The gospel, the good news, is like a mosaic of stories, each one part of a larger story, yet beautiful and truthful on its own. There's no formula, there's no blueprint, but in every life that it touches, it is good news. And every life that it touches, it empowers to be part of the beautiful, nuanced, diverse mosaic of stories and histories that give shape together to the big story. And so there's a story in the climax of Jesus' ministry that reminds us of this and reminds us that each of our stories are invited to be a part of it. We find the story uh, told by the author of Matthew in chapter 26 of Matthew. Jesus has journeyed to Jerusalem and where he'll soon begin running head-on into religion and imperial powers of the day. But for now, he's settling down for dinner with friends. It wasn't anything big. They just ordered some pizza, and they gathered around the table to eat. I think that's how it goes. Uh, but Jesus, of course, uh, cannot even have a simple dinner with friends without being a little bit transgressive. And so they are having dinner at the house of Simon the leper, of course, um, which was a no-no, but that's just how Jesus rolls everywhere he goes. So now Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, and a woman comes to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she pours it on his head as he sat at the table. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a strange story to me. <laughs> 
Um, it doesn't sound like a positive thing in our day and age. That, like, I imagine that I'm just you know, having dinner along and a person comes out of nowhere and cracks open the finest bottle of, of Britney perfume and just breaks it over my head. <laughs> Um, it might make the news. It might stir some, you know, stir some emotions. Hopefully, it is not <clears throat> toxic. <laughs> there, yes, thank you, thank you, very much. <laughs> All right, let's pull Brittany down. But back in the context, I just had to get that in somehow. I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> um, all right. Next time I'm sitting at the dinner table in public, I'm just gonna be looking over my shoulder. Or something, so. But back in the context of the day, um, what happened right here in this moment, as strange as it might seem to us, what happened in this moment was, was deeply powerful and important. Because back then, anointing someone with oil like this was a sign of utter honor and respect. Uh, kings and queens were anointed at their coronation. And so there's this moment here of this woman showing up and with deep generosity and this authentic expression of appreciation for Jesus. She, she expresses it in this way, uh, expressing her appreciation and her gratitude and her, her reverence for this person who has brought good news to the world and probably to her life and to her story as well. And of course, the disciples don't get it. The disciples see it and they're, they're angry, it says, and they say, why this waste? Because sometimes, uh, as we begin to make these decisions to let our lives not be held in bottles, but to be poured out for those around us, uh, sometimes pouring ourselves out and, and choosing to live our life for good and not just living it for getting, but for generosity and not just ambition, but for the good of the world around us, it can seem like a waste. It can be a scary thing. But that's only when we're looking at that small story and not the big story of the God who invites us to pour our love and our life into our world. The God who fills us and empowers us so that we can pour out our story, not just for ourselves, but for the good of all that our story intersects. Now, that big story. And so the disciples didn't get that big story in the moment. Neither did, I think, this generous woman uh, know exactly what her story meant and what the effect that it would have on Jesus. Because though no one else around that table really knew, Jesus, I think, knew a little bit about what he was about to face in Jerusalem. He was about to face the most difficult trial and experience of his life. Soon he would be arrested by the leaders of empire and religion and tried in an unjust proceeding and convicted. He'd be crucified and, and publicly executed, all for bringing this message and embodying the message of good news. He knew that he was about to face a difficult season. And this gracious woman's authentic outpouring of generosity and affirmation and appreciation and honor, Jesus said, this has prepared me for what I'm about to face. She had no idea what it meant for her to pour her story out in that moment, but when it intersected Jesus's story. It became part of something bigger. And so he says this amazing statement, truly I tell you, wherever the story of good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Wherever the story of good news is told, her story will be a part of it. Which was amazing, one, because Women's stories did not get to be told, and often don't today as well. And second, that that Jesus elevated her story alongside his, that she was a part of this story of good news, in part because of the power of this moment, but, but also because that's just how it works, that your story, that our stories are a part of the big story. That as we lay them out and offer them to something bigger than ourselves, to our neighbor and to the work of God, of love in our world, that they become part of the big story of good news. And right now, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your workplace, in your classroom, right now there is a story that is being written with every step of your journey. And when we let our stories and what we have and what, who we are overflow in love to the world around us, like an outpouring of authentic love. 
for our neighbor, for God, and for ourselves. When our diverse stories intersect and in some way carry on the good news, they become part of the story, part of that beautiful community mosaic that is the big story of God's good news love at work in our world. And there is nothing like it when our story gets told as good news. And so this generous woman had no idea in that moment what hung in the balance. She just simply authentically poured out what she had for the good and for the flourishing of others. And little did she know where that story would lead and what it would mean to the world around us. And it's the same way for us. We have no idea what hangs in the balance in our choice to live lives of good news and love and life and liberation. In our classroom, in the cafeteria, in the break room, in the workplace, in the quiet conversations, in compassionate acts, in the courageous opportunities to stand up to injustice and exclusion, to racism or bigotry, in the choices to welcome the stranger and to pour out what we have to honor and to affirm those around you in love and in life and in good news. Who knows where that story will lead? We don't know what hangs in the balance, but we do know that it will lead to life, to life abundant, to good news for our world, and to those things that we most hope that our story will tell at the end of the day, that our stories will be stories of life and love and meaning and purpose, of selflessness, of cultivating creativity and life in our world, that our stories will lead to life, that they'll walk in the way of Jesus that leads to life and good news for all people, that it will lead to the big story. Because in those moments when you choose to love your neighbor as yourself, when you choose to reach out in the cafeteria to those that no one else is sitting with, when you choose friendship over division, when you choose to stand up to injustice rather than complacency. When we choose those things, we are joining our story to the biggest story of all. The big story that we glimpse in that diverse, captivating story of good news of the Jesus who came to live in a thousand ways, in a thousand steps to bring life to our world and all that that means. The Jesus whose story was there, who came to teach, to tell stories, to protest, to to turn over tables, to touch people who weren't supposed to be touched, to eat with people who weren't supposed to be eaten with, to break bread, to pour wine, to wash feet, to face temptation, to tick off the authorities, to fulfill scripture, to forgive, to announce the start of a brand new kingdom, and to show us the character and the heart of that life with God and our neighbor, to show us what God is like, to love all and to love enemies to the point of death at their hands and to show that not even death in the grave can stop the love and the life that is growing because God's love wins. That's the story that we are invited in our world to help write. And our stories belong to that story. We belong to that story of love and life, liberation, of peace and purpose, of joy and justice. And when we join in our time, the good news becomes again, as it always has been, a story unleashed in a thousand ways in our world. And with every act of good news that this world is so desperately seeking, we are writing it in our chapter. And so this year, this is our story to write in our workplaces, in our schools, in our family and friend groups, in our community, in our political structures, in our world. This is our chapter of that good news story, and we are being invited to join, to authentically offer ourselves, and to pour out whatever we have for others, to love our neighbor, ourselves, and the God who is with us every step. That's the call this season, to be people of good news of justice and peace and joy, of the love of God and neighbor in ourselves. This is our story to write in our times, in our places, as open as ourselves with our story in all its sacred worth.
a big story, and we belong. And so friends, may we embody and enact and tell the story of good news in our time. May we pour out what we have in love, and may we tell our story in the way of Jesus, in the power of a love that wins. Life, love, and flourishing for all people. This year, may those be the places that our story goes. Let's pray together. Gracious, loving God, thank you for your big story that has brought us here, God, that has drawn us to your heart, that has loved us from the very beginning. God, thank you. God, we join the song that's been going in creation for billions of years, that's been singing out in every culture and place, the song of your creation singing back to you. God, we join that big story. The particular now in our generation, this call is for us to be people of good news, of healing and reconciliation, of hope and of goodness. God, it seems impossible to be a part of that big story on our own, but with your empowerment, we can do it because you invite us just to put one step of love in front of the other. One step of courage and compassion, conviction and creativity. This semester, this season of life, God, let our story be a part of yours, that we might be people of good news. We pray all of this in incredible name. Amen.